What is the secret to unlocking your full potential? What makes your idols any different than you? How do you become the person you've always wanted to be in life? This is where you get all of your questions answered. My name is Justin Shank, and I sit down with some of the most epic individuals who are changing the world with their actions in business and in life. We discuss how they did it, why they pushed themselves, and more importantly, how they were able to focus on continuous growth to achieve their dreams. Welcome to the Growth Now Movement. This week, I sit down with Brian Bogert. You know that feeling when you connect with somebody and you instantly know this person is heart-centered and driven solely by the act of giving and lifting up others around him? That's how it was when I got to connect with Brian, and you guys are going to hear in this conversation why. This guy is truly driven by the idea of helping people reach their goals and help them get to the next level. You see, Brian teaches people how to leverage radical authenticity and awareness to create the intentional life they've been dreaming of. His revolutionary strategy, Embrace Pain to Avoid Suffering, has helped individuals, groups, and entire companies break beyond their normal to achieve the success in life and business that they've always wanted. Now, if you guys have been listening to my show for quite some time, I often talk about fake life coaches, right? People who buy that certificate to the go then be a life coach, but they don't really have experience on teaching people these things. They haven't implemented it long enough. They haven't done the things. And Brian and I talk about that. We talk about how a lot of times we have to go do the work. And then as teachers, we're given the opportunity to turn around and take our experiences and make them teaching points for others. And he's a great example of that, you know, previously growing a business to $15 million annually uh, and so much more. And, And just his personal things that he had to overcome in his life physically, mentally, and everything else in between. You guys are going to love this conversation. Now, before we get there, I want to remind you guys that Growth Now Movement Live has gone virtual. It is now Growth Now Summit, a virtual experience where you're going to learn how to level up in all areas of your life. If you want to create a seven-figure business online, you're going to learn how to do that from Natalie Jill. If you want to learn how to quickly scale to a multiple six-figure coaching business, you're going to learn that from Brooks Holland. If you want to learn how to shift into the person you're meant to be, you're going to learn that from Anthony Trucks. If you want to speak on the biggest stages in the world, you're going to learn that from Nick Sanson and so, and the moment is now. It is time for you to truly step into who you are meant to be. So head over to gnmlive.com slash virtual and get your tickets now because it is going to be a life-changing experience and you guys are going to love how unique it is compared to other virtual events. Now, without further ado, let's get to the episode with Brian Bogert. Brian, welcome to the show, man. I'm excited to be here, brother. Thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, man. You know, Anthony Trucks connected us. I had to stop and think for a second before I, I hopped in the Zoom room here to f- remember how we got connected. But Anthony Trucks connected us. And if he introduces me to somebody, I'm like, yes, let me hop on a call. Uh, and we hopped on a call. and We chatted for 45 minutes, almost an hour, just about life and everything that you're working on and all these cool things. And then you made a really cool introduction for me to David Meltzer. Uh, and we're doing like a trade of sorts and uh, just just really cool. But the thing was that I was sold on you was your heart. Like you brought so much heart to the conversation. It was it was really about how can I how can I deliver? How can I give? How can I add value to you? Um, and then I was like, dude, I don't want you just to add value to me. I want you to add value to my audience. And so here we are. Uh, but why don't <laughs> why don't we take a second and you tell us who is Brian today? Um, and then we're going to unpack how you got there. Wow. So that's a really interesting twist and I love it. Most people are like, start with how you got here and then we'll talk about today. Um, You know, who am I today, man? I'm going to just talk about the roles that I play, I think more than anything. Um, And I'm going to start with the most important roles that I play, uh, which are very much who I am, which is as a husband, as a father. I have to start there because every single thing that I do and everything that I'm doing today, everything that I've done the last decade has all been for the benefit of those three individuals, my beautiful wife, who I'm forever indebted to and the gift that she gave me and my children. And then our two beautiful rays of sunshine. We've got a six-year-old and a five-year-old. So I have to start there. Um, But I also love business. I love people. I love getting people unstuck into the next level. And so I'm a human behavior and performance coach and speaker. Uh, And as we'll unpack over the course of this period of time, I have some really unique experiences in my life, which mean nothing, frankly, unless I was able to extract the lessons from those experiences and then be able to apply them in my life. 
Um, and then I'm just big on, you said it in the very beginning, and thank you for saying that I led with my heart and that's what it is. My wife and I have this philosophy, give until it hurts. And so the reality of it is, is like, I'm a philanthropist. So I work in the community. I work with nonprofits. And anytime I can help an individual or an organization become more aware, more intentional, and more of who they already are, that's when magic happens and the door begins to crack the perspective, motivation, and direction. So I like to think that I'm a giver. And it's funny that you said that because my purpose in life, I believe, is to provide. Mm. And that means a whole bunch of different things. But that's who I am today. Um, and again, most importantly, husband and father. But I like to do whatever I can to help anybody else. Yeah, man. And and it's true. And, and that's exactly who you are. And that's why there's certain times you can have conversations with people and you're like, yeah, you're not telling me the truth. <laughs> there's something else that we're not peeling back here or whatever the case may be. But, but you are who you present yourself to be, which I love, man. And uh, we're going to get into the journey a little bit. But I, one thing I'm always intrigued by are people who get into your space as a coach, as a mentor, mm -hmm. as a speaker. Um, everybody comes from different walks of life, but there's always they're always driven by different things. So number one, my first part of the question is what drew you to the self-development space? Like why did it, why is it something you wanted to be a part of? Uh, and what beyond that, like what is your own personal journey of like, I need to now help other people because I find a lot of times people who are the coaches and the mentors, are the people who struggled more than anybody else. Yeah. So it's funny that you, the very first question, I didn't grow up wanting to be in the self-development space. And frankly, right. most of my adult and professional life thus far wasn't really leading me there either. Um, I have always applied that philosophy to myself, right? So I measure myself against who I was yesterday. Am I making progress? Am I moving? Am I growing? And I've always had different philosophies that have kind of driven that, that standpoint. Six, just over six years ago, um, our son's six and a half. And we were about four months into having him. And all of a sudden, and I started with it, right? Everything in my life has been for the benefit of my family. Mm. Four months went by like that. And all of a sudden, I had an aha moment. Thankfully, I was aware of it, where it was one of those moments where I had to pause and recognize that the pattern that I always said I didn't want to replicate is that guy or that gal that just put everything into their business for 30 or 40 years. And all of a sudden, they wake up one day and their family's not there. I never wanted that. And I always said that wasn't going to be me. Well, four months in, that was the path I was on. I was burning the candle at both ends. I was not actually focused on my time and energy with my family. I was providing for them financially, yeah. right? I was giving them freedom and the ability to do it, but I wasn't there for my wife. I wasn't there for my son. And this aha moment made me realize I need to take a step back and recalibrate. And I don't say this to impress. I say it to impress upon the point that it was the first time in my life that I didn't feel like I had the mentors, the people in my life, nor did I feel like I was smart enough to figure it out myself. So hmm. I went out and hired my first coach. I interviewed 15 of them. Oh right? my gosh. And, That's crazy. And, the, and the reason I did, frankly, is because the first 14 were individuals that hung their hat as a coach. Hmm. They went and they got a certification. They did something here, but they didn't have the relevance or the credibility that I felt was going to push me to the next level. And by the way, I don't say that to bash on all these people that are out there hanging their hats as coaches and who go through certifications. But for me, it wasn't going to help get me to where I needed to be because right. it was a one size fits all program. It wasn't, how do I maximize who I am? So I landed on a coach and I, I'm, I'm going to share his name because he's friends with a number of the people on the board behind you. And he's just, he was a phenomenal resource in my life. A guy by the name of Ben Newman out of St. Louis. And within a month of working with him, Ben said, Brian, you got to be doing this. And I said, yeah, 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 whatever, Ben, I'm paying you a lot of money not to tell me how great I am, but tell me, figure out these other things. Yeah. And he said, no, dude, like you don't get it. And what we'll unpack here in a second, right, is some of the things that really led me there. But I've been speaking on stages. I've been coaching people informally for years because to me, that's like what gets me excited. I love to be able to see people break through those boundaries, live with no limits and operate in a way where they're just free, fulfilled and going after what they can accomplish in life. And so he trickled it every single month for about nine months until the universe gave me signs that I couldn't refuse. I mean, literally, it was like shoved down my throat for about a month where it was like, okay, 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 I got to listen. And then I jumped in. Um, and I've had it really running for about five years. And that's where it was. You talked about what got me to where I'm at, right? And I think that that's what's really important here is it's not just personal. It's not just professional. It's the combination of both. Yeah. And then really recognizing that I don't believe in balance in life. I believe in integration in life. 
right? There is no such work-life balance. There's integration. We have one life. We've got one shot at this thing. So let's give it all we've got. I want everybody who's listening or watching right now to just close your eyes for one second. And I want you to imagine walking out of a store after a successful shopping trip, heading to your car and turning your head to see a truck barreling 40 miles an hour right at you. That's where one of the first pivotal moments in my life started was in that moment. My mom, my brother and I had gone to get a one inch paintbrush. And as we're heading back to the car, I've always had an excitement and vigor and energy towards life. So it wasn't a surprise to my mom that I was three or four feet ahead of them. And I got to the car first, waited for her to unlock the door so we could get home to use that paintbrush. And as we're standing there waiting for her to catch up and unlock the doors, a truck pulled up in front of the store, driver and middle passenger got out and the passenger all the way to the right felt the truck moving backwards and did what any one of us would do, moved over to put his foot on the brake, but he instead hit the gas. Ugh. combination of shock and force threw him up onto the steering wheel, up onto the dashboard. And before you know it, he's catapulting 40 miles an hour right at us. Now we were parked into an end spot. So we went up and over the median, went up over the tree in the median. We believed that I was holding onto the handle, knocked me to the ground, ran over me diagonally, tore my spleen, left a tire track scar on my stomach and mm. continued on to completely sever my left arm from my body. Wow. So there we are, we're laying in a 110 degree day on the asphalt in Phoenix, Arizona in the middle of August. And my arm is 10 feet away. And my guardian angel, frankly, walked out of the store right at that time. She saw the life and limb scenario that was ahead of her. And she immediately ran over and stopped the bleeding at my wound to save wow. my life. Otherwise, yeah. I wouldn't be here with you today. I mean, I, the blood loss alone from an injury like that, I could have been dead in minutes if she oh, wasn't yeah. there. And she was aware enough at that moment to also be intentional and instruct innocent bystanders to run inside, grab a cooler and get my arm on ice within minutes. Otherwise I wouldn't have an arm today. And so there's a whole lot more to this story, right? But the reality of it is, is there was two primary lessons that have really been guiding lights for me as a result of this. The first is I learned very early, very young, not to get stuck by what has happened to me, but get moved by what I could do with it. Mm. And that, that was very easily ingrained when I'm laying in the ICU next to kids who have terminal illnesses who might be dead a month from now. And other than knowing whether or not I'd be able to use my arm at that point in the future, I was going to be alive. Mm. So as a seven-year-old, that was one of those perspective moments where I was like, okay, now I need to figure out what do I do with this so that I can help other people. And then the second wasn't one that I realized until far later, but this has been one of the guiding principles of my life, frankly. And it's what contributed to business and other elements of success in my life. And it was from witnessing the hours and hours and hours of sacrifice that my parents made to ultimately strengthen me. The years of unceasing medical treatments and therapy and everything to be able to move my hand and have feeling and all the rehab. You know, I was in a fog as a seven, eight, nine, ten 10 year old, but my parents weren't right. So it wasn't until far later that I realized that whether it was intentional or not, they were ingraining in me a habit and a way of living. They taught me to embrace pain to avoid suffering. And it was this same philosophy that I've used to not only overcome this unique injury, but how our, my business partners and I built our last business from a quarter million to over 15 million in revenue within the span of a decade. And how I've helped hundreds of individuals and organizations become more aware, more intentional, and more of who they already are, their most authentic selves. So I know that not everybody was expecting it to go there today. But like I said early on, what's important is that we become aware of the lessons we can extract and then become intentional with how do we apply them in our lives. Yeah, you know, and that's something that when we talked before, I, you know, you told me not in depth, but you told me what had happened. Um, you know, you losing your arm, you getting it reattached. And immediately my brain goes to what most people would think in that moment is my life as we know it is over. And they'll sit in the what is and what could have been versus yep. what can I create from this? And right. And so somebody we both follow and, and somebody I admire greatly, and a friend of mine, Ed Milet, says all the time, life is not happening to me, it's happening for me That's and right. very similar to what you just said. So how does somebody shift out of the victim mentality mindset so they're able to see these obstacles as opportunity? Yeah, so I think it's all about perspective, right? And I think what, you know, the, the old adage, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger is antiquated, but mm -hmm. it's also a challenge of perspective because it causes, causes us to see our challenges through a lens of meeting, right? Now for me, there wasn't the ability to sit in that space for very long. I could have allowed myself to, I guess, 
But the reality of it is, is as a seven-year-old, trust me, I felt like, why me? Why this? Why whatever? But as I'm sitting in the ICU for two weeks, and I'm literally watching kids around me, not knowing if they're going to live for another month, that was really hard for me to be like, oh, poor me, right? Mm -hmm. Poor me, I got run over, and poor me, I got my arm ripped off, right? Yes, I was going to have struggles, but I was going to live, literally. After the initial threat of my life, I was going to live. And so for me, I think perspective is, is key. Yeah. So when we look at just what you said, how do, we get, how do we put ourselves in a position where we can learn how to get unstuck by that, learn to get moved by what's happened to us in our lives, and how do we put that into, into, into application? Seek perspective. I think there are so many people around us that we can learn from. And so the collective wisdom of tapping into who we are as people and recognizing that my struggles make me stronger, but I can learn from your struggles. You can mm. learn from my struggles. It, it, it really does shift us to that place of looking at it through a lens of meaning versus why is this happening to me? Yeah, no, no, dude, I, I love that for sure. And, you know, obviously when I was a kid, obviously not anything compared to you, but I broke both my hips. And I remember thinking the same thing where we were, I was in a room, it was in Children's Hospital, Philadelphia, and I was in a room and I was there for, I think, a total of three weeks. Like I was in the regular hospital for a week and then the rehab hospital for two weeks, um, lear learning how to, you know, walk, bend my knee again, do all these things. And I remember meeting a girl, I was with my mom, we met this girl who ended up having th like, I think three different implants or replacements within her body. I think it was like a, a heart, a, a kidney, a liver. And I was like, I have nothing. I have nothing to complain about. But I think so often people walk through life and they have these blinders on, right? Mm -hmm. And they're going through life and they're like, oh, well, it was me. And there's, they're not paying attention to what else is going on around them. Or they'll see something going on with somebody else and they, they'll go, oh, well, yeah, but they have this or they have that, yeah. right? So what are things people can do to program themselves to get out of that mentality and realize I'm, I should be grateful for what's going on right now versus that victim and those blinders? Oh, Justin, here's the thing. You said the key word. Right. I think that for people to really get themselves out of their own place in their mind, out of feeling sorry for themselves, out of feeling down or woe is me or why me, it starts with gratitude. And if we put ourselves, our minds, our souls, our energy, our emotions into a place of gratitude intentionally, it's very difficult for some of those other emotions to coexist. And we have to be able to take toll on where we are grateful right? So for me, a great example, I was in a position where I'm sitting there. I was grateful for my life. Mm. At that moment, I had no clue if I'd have access to my arm again, if it would actually be reattached successfully. Although it was physically reattached at that moment, in the first two weeks in the hospital, who knew, yeah. right? There was a 25 surgery reconstruction. After one or two surgeries, do we know if it's going to actually be successful? If I'm going to have feeling or movement in my hand again? And so I had to be really grateful in that moment for where I was. And it's easy to sit here and say as a seven-year-old that I put myself into a place of gratitude, right? Mm -hmm. And I did, but you don't have the same perspective at seven as you do in future years. Right. And so I'll give you one more example. When I was 20, I rebroke my arm snowboard, compound fracture, almost lost it again, went 10 months with it hanging by my side. But what I learned in that period of time is that I had built up this crusty exterior that I had everything under control that I could do it all myself. I built this narrative, right? That wasn't based in gratitude. It was based in scarcity. Mm. It was based in this belief that I didn't need anybody's help because I had everything that I needed and I was going to be able to be successful. I don't, I can overcome anything. I can break whatever boundaries I want. I had convinced myself of that. And so now all of a sudden when I'm in a really vulnerable position, again, as an adult, not knowing whether or not my arm was going to be successfully fused again from the bone, would I be able to use it again? Was I going to lose it again? I didn't know in that moment. I had to apply that same thought process. And I had to reconnect with that same mentality around, hey, guess what? I'm still here. I'm still alive. I'm still kicking. Um, and I had to really then shift my mentality around gratitude for other people, gratitude for this help that we can receive, gratitude for what we can give, right? So it's really about perspective and finding ways to put ourselves in a position to see, look, we're way better off than most people. And you and I sitting here right now in the United States of America, despite all the craziness that's going on, are better off than 99% of the world population. Yeah. Period. Right? 
And you and I also are better off than a majority of individuals in our country for a whole variety of reasons that we've been blessed to receive and put ourselves in those positions. But when you can take a look at that and realize, hey, there's a lot of people who are way worse off than you, not only does gratitude come into place and perspective come into place, but motivation to figure out how can you make an impact and help elevate and empower the rest of the individuals that might not have had the same opportunities. Mm. Yeah. And, and it's so true, man. And I love, I just love the way the words flow out of your mouth. Like you just get it right. Like you understand the things that you need to do. And it's because of the choices that you made in your life and the things that you went through and everything else in between, you truly lived what you're preaching, right? You talked a little bit about how you took this company from $250,000 to $15 million a year and people are going to go, Holy crap, why would you ever leave that behind? So I want to get into that part of your life a little bit. Um, because honestly, most people, most people would really go, Holy crap, why would you ever leave that behind? Why would you just up and leave to go do something else like $15 yeah. million dollars a year. That's, that's not a small amount of money. So let's talk a little bit about, first of all, that, that business and, and the growth of that. But then what, what was the decision for you to go, okay, I'm out. I, I don't want to be a part of this anymore. Yeah. So the business and the growth of that, it was just phenomenal. And again, I, I, I said it early, it was my business partners and I, and a whole bunch of smart people that we ended up putting, uh, putting us around. Um, but when it started, right, there was really no presence in, in our market. Uh, for this organization. So we were a series of LLCs. We were tacked into a larger organization, but nobody knew who we were. And so it was actually a really fun time because I got to learn a whole lot about building a business, how to lead people, how to make sure that every single person, no matter what our title, we were all pulling in the same direction. So if I had to take the trash out or do something that might not seem like it was what my role was, it really showed the ability to bring a team together. And that's what happened. We formed a family. So it went from two of us to over 60 of us over the course of a decade. That was a blast, right? And it was fun and it was great. And I did grow and it was phenomenal. What I realized though, a few years back is that I'm a builder, not an operator. Mm. And so I like to build people in organizations. And so for five years, I ran my coaching and speaking business alongside this other business with no intent to go chase it full time, frankly. But the more I spent time coaching, the more I spent time speaking, the more I could empower and elevate people across the country, across the globe with the type of work that we were doing, it just all of a sudden made me want to spend more time there, right? I could really impact the lives of these 60 people, or I could broaden it and really be able to help save the lives or impact or empower the lives of millions. I told you before, I want to impact a billion people in my life. If I stayed on the other trajectory, there's no way that was going to happen just because of pure time and capacity. I want to unpack the concept, embrace pain to avoid suffering, because that is frankly the answer as to why I decided to leave. So I think it's important for us to understand this. For sure. And I'm not going to go into the definitions between pain and suffering. If we want to unpack that later, we can. But just for simplistic sense, I want to give three or four examples of this concept. People can embrace the pain of hitting the gym 30 minutes a day to avoid the suffering of aches and pains of a sedentary lifestyle. People can embrace the pain of a difficult conversation with a loved one or a spouse to avoid the suffering of a loveless marriage that might end up in divorce or frankly being stuck in a marriage when they really want to divorce, Mm. right? People can embrace the pain of having their kids put away their tablets and mobile devices at the dinner table and the fits they're sure to throw to avoid the suffering of years of lost meaningful conversation. As business owners, we can embrace the pain of firing our top salesperson because of the biggest strain on our culture and the biggest inhibitor to our future growth, even though their top line revenue generation is good to avoid the suffering of a business that's going to die because of that. Yeah. Right. So I was in a position and it just so happened. It was about just over a year ago. My wife and I had a phenomenal weekend together. And as we're going to pick up the kids, she looked across the, the car to me and she said, Brian, how would you feel if you didn't have to go to the office on Monday? I looked at her, I was like, that was a pretty loaded question. What do you get? <laughs> and I had some other health stuff that was going on that I had just figured out really over the couple of years prior to that. And she said, you know, I think you let some of these health things allow fear to enter into your world in a way that you never have. And I think you've convinced yourself that you need the money, the security, the success, the establishment of this business that we, you know, we're a part of building from the ground up. And she said, I also think that you're just barely scratching the surface of your potential. And you're dying a little bit inside every single day because you're not having the impact on the world that you want. So she said, I'm just here to tell you, we took a big bet on you once. And if you want to, 
let's double down on that bet and let's go mm. see what you can do. So my wife, which I is not lost on me, had the courage to embrace the pain of looking at me and telling me that she knew that I wasn't happy and fulfilled in every capacity of my life. It's huge. Right. To avoid the suffering of what I was going to become if I stayed on that path. She put herself in a position of vulnerability, recognizing that we were going to walk away from a whole lot, right? To basically put me and us in a position to make sure that we were happy, free, fulfilled. Mm. And so I had to go through a very systematic approach of unpacking that. What do I want? Is this what I want to chase? What impact do I want to have? What fears do I have that I need to lean into, better understand what's holding me back from an emotional standpoint? And what became very clear to me is I had to embrace the pain of walking away from a known thing to avoid the suffering of not ever knowing what I could do. Yeah. And so that was what happened. So we put the process into place. And over the course of about a year, we transitioned out of the business, executed the buy sell. And uh, I've been chasing this full time ever since. And then it was like COVID and, and it put a, you know, put a yeah. hope to the plan, right? Like you're like, I'm going to travel the country. I'm going to speak all over. I'm going to be speaking to corporations at events. <laughs> And stuff like that, right? But again, we had a conversation the first time we spoke and we talked about that, right? Like with this thing happening right now, there's massive opportunity to, to make a shift, to understand, you know, even, even if the shift is taking a step back and going, let me reevaluate my messaging. Let me reevaluate what I'm doing, yeah. right? You know, there's a lot of people that listen to this show who they want to become a coach. They want to become a speaker. They want to become, you know, a podcaster whose show does well and, and everything else in between because they found me and they're like, if that schmuck can do it, I can do it too. <laughs> but, but the reality is, you know, I started as an entrepreneur, as a, a podcast coach and I became a podcast coach because I became successful as a podcaster. And then it transitioned into a growth coach where I teach people how to build platforms and get on stages and grow, grow their brand because I did that. And now I'm coaching people to do that, right? It's not one of those things where it's like, oh, I yeah. bought that certificate. I mean, it was great. I'm so glad you brought totally. that up because this is like one of my, this is one of my pain points in life right now uh, is talking about these people who they, they want the fast way. They want, to, they want to just go buy a course and sit there for eight hours and go, oh, I'm a coach. But the issue with that is number one, they're, they're then sending the wrong information to the wrong people or the right information to the wrong people, however you want to look at it. Uh, and the second portion is, you know, they haven't really done the work. And so they're going to then fail in what they felt was their passion, right? Yep. Because they, they're, it's just, it's just not going to be long-term success for a majority of those people who do it that way. So what can you say to somebody who says, Hey, look, I've got this big dream. I want to be a coach. I want to be a speaker. How do they begin the process, right? Like I kind of like how you did it. Yeah, the success in the business, but you did it for five years on the side and really built. Talk a little bit about that and the, the perseverance and the persistence through doing that on the side. Yeah, so I, I want to start by just acknowledging what you just said. There is no such thing as an overnight success. And I could remember who to attribute this next quote to, but it's one of my favorite. And it's people are celebrated in public for what they've practiced in private for years. Mm. It just doesn't happen. There is no quick win. There is no, it just doesn't exist. Right. And so really what I did was I didn't know when I started my business that this is what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I had a big interest in helping people, but I was, I could do that without being compensated or, or being a full-time coach or speaker, right? Like I already was living that. And so this was a way for me to get much more intentional and deeper with my work with individuals to really be able to help them evolve, empower them to grow. So the more I did it, the more I refined my skill sets, both in how I was going to present on stage, because I've never viewed myself, nor do I want to be described as a pure motivational speaker. <laughs> I have nothing wrong with that. I, I, you know, I've talked to you referenced David Meltzer earlier. He said to me at one point, he's like, yeah, I love it. Cause we need the motivational speakers to give people that spark, but I want to be the people who get there. Yeah. And that's kind of how I'm at. I want to, I want to empower people. I don't want to create dependency on me. And so that's what I had to learn how to do is shift from pure perspective uh, and telling my story for the benefit of like an organization or how I grew from it to how do I take now personal adversity, my professional adversity, and put it into a package so that people can replicate some of the behaviors and aspects of things that they can learn and grow from. So that was a huge learning curve for me that took place over the course of five years, frankly, and I'm still growing day over day, week over week, month over month. But the five years was really around, look, I had no intent to go chase this full time when I first did it. But because of that, because I was detached and because I was focused so much on impact, the more I did it, the more I wanted to do it. 
Mm. And it just so happened that the more I did it, the more organically it grew as well. Because if you focus on impact over impressions, then you're doing it for the right reasons. And that's how I've entered into it. So I don't say that to like brag on myself, like, oh yeah, look, I do it for the right reasons. But like legitimately, I want to make an impact. I want people to be better when they interact with me, whether they hire me or whether they just see me, whether they consume a piece of the content. If there's something I can do to change the trajectory of somebody's life, dude, that's a powerful drive for me that's bigger than most things. And so I did this five years while I was still growing in the other business, while we were still growing our revenue, hiring people, focusing on impact in the community. But it allowed me to build the foundation that was solid enough that by the time my wife gave me that push and gave me that permission, I was ready to go do it. And I tested it. I knew where I was at. I knew what my skill sets were. I knew where a lot of the gaps were. And I didn't know what I didn't know in certain ways. So I'm still learning actively through the process. But I think that when, when you ask the question, what should someone do? I think get really, really clear on what's important to you. Mm. What is the impact that you want to make? Who do you need to be to fulfill that? Right. And when we really think about whether it's in business or in life or in any other aspect, the three steps really to this embrace pain, avoid suffering philosophy are to acknowledge the suffering we wish to avoid. That's the inverse, frankly, to getting really, really clear on what's important to us, who we are, the impact we want to make on the world. Right. The second step is to identify the pains that we tend to avoid and learn to embrace them. So I'll use a gym example for me right? I knew because of the imbalance in my back that if I was able to get into the gym, stay lean, stay strong, that the suffering in my back would be mitigated. When I went to the gym to first start doing that, I realized that I was in a self-defeating pattern that I couldn't keep myself moving. Well, it wasn't the actual working out that was keeping me in that self-defeating pattern. It was the anxiety in a crowded gym, Mm. right? So in the same case with this business, right? Is it Is it my other business that's keeping me back from having the impact? Do they complement each other? Do they fulfill each other? What pains do I need to embrace to go make sure that I'm having the impact I want? And then lastly, learning to establish that as a habit in everything we do. And so I think for anybody that's doing it, find a mentor, find a coach, find somebody that's in the space to pick their brain. If you're interested in it, learn about it, become aware of what are the hurdles in your way, and then become intentional to systematically break down those hurdles and build your skill sets right? We have the ability and the control to influence the direction of our lives. That's mm. what I'm encouraging people to do. No, I, yeah, I love that, man. It's, it's funny. Cause you know, as we talk about this, you know, certain things come up and like a lot of people come to me and they say, Hey, Justin, how do I speak on stages like you do? Now, this pre COVID obviously, oh, how do I speak on stages like you do? And I go, well, it's like, like, how do you do it? What do you do? Who do you contact? Who's this? I go, everybody asks me to speak on their stage. I've actually never once reached out to anybody and said, Hey, I want to speak at, at your event. Um, I'm a big believer in the understanding that allow your work to speak for itself. And if it's loud enough, people are going to reach out. Right. Like, and actually it came up, I think yesterday on my time hop or my memories from Facebook, I guess I was having a day about a year or two ago. I think it was two years ago. And I put something like, stop asking me how you can get booked on my show and go out and do something that's going to make it, make sure every single podcaster can ignore you. Right. And I think about that with what you're building, right? You're literally putting the pieces together and the work in so nobody can ignore you. You know, you're about to be on a show with David Meltzer for a third time, right? David Meltzer's a guy in the space. If people don't know who he is, they soon will because he's going to be on the show, thanks to you. But, um, you know, he's a guy in the space that is greatly regarded and, and respected. And I see you and he goes, okay, cool. Come do this. Now do this. Now do this. And then there's more in the pipeline because you show up and you do the work. And then that speaks for itself. Not because you're a better salesman, not because you're a smoother talker, even though you're a very smooth talker, not because any of these things, right? It's because of the work that you put in. So can we speak to that a little bit for people listening on the fact that like, how do you, how do you put in the work during those times where you feel like the work is not giving you the feedback, isn't giving you the things you're putting into it yet? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I think it, it does go back to getting really, really clear on what's important. So when I think about my purpose, right? And I told you my purpose is to provide. Now I have five or six different clarifiers around what that actually means to me. Mm-hmm. But my purpose overtakes the pain. So when I talk about embracing the pain, if I connect deeply to what do I believe I'm on this planet for? What is the impact that I can have? What's the legacy that I want to leave? Right on the days that I don't want to, I've got the energy to do it. Now, 
That's also said through the lens of, I'm not one of those guys that's going to shame people into working 20 hours a week, or I mean, sorry, 20 hours a day, right? Like I'm not, I'm not one of those different people have different energy levels. Different people have different skill sets. Different people have different opportunities. And so I am not a one size fits all believer in like, you've got to get this clear, but everything begins and ends with you, Justin, everything. And so if you know who you are, you know, the impact that you want to leave the days that it's difficult really aren't as difficult as it would be if you're trying to slam yourself down a path because somebody told you that you should be there. I think too often what we find is that people are literally being told their entire lives who they should be, how they should enter into the world, the roles they should play, the jobs they should get, the things they should have. It's all these shoulds. And I I react viscerally when I hear the word should because it's automatically suggesting that whatever you're doing isn't good enough. But you are the only person who can determine what should happen in your life. And so I'm a big believer that, you know, I work with individuals who are high performers already, who are often earning multiple six figures, have successful businesses or doing these things. And the reality of it is, is they've learned how to channel and embrace the pain for very certain things, but the patterns and behaviors in their life are also keeping them stuck in other areas. And so we've got to really help them get clear on what is it that they're trying to experience? What do they want to do? So some get way too isolated, just like I did, where it was like, I wasn't focused on my family. All of a sudden they're 10 years in, their kids are eight, nine, 10 years old. They're making a million bucks a year, but they're miserable and they haven't really found a way to rein it back in. That's got to start with, what do I want? What experiences do I want to have with my family, with my kids, with my wife or husband? right? How do I actually structure this in a way that I can be intentional? Because if I know that and I'm intentional and I create a life of alignment, then it becomes self-regulating. Right. So the reality of it is it is work. It is pain that does happen. And there is nothing worthwhile in life that comes easy. Nothing. It just Mm -hmm. doesn't happen that way. But if we can recognize that on the front end, prepare ourselves for that. And we know where we're headed. We know what serves us on that path and we can put in the work every single day we need to. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And, and, you know, obviously finding your purpose is such a key to, to everything, right? Like that's what keeps most entrepreneurs going, if not all of them going, especially in the beginning, like to understand the big picture, to keep their, you know, your vision clear and all those things is, is beyond important. And the cool part with your story is that you have these tiers of success. You've created success in multiple realms of your life, right? You've overcome adversity. You created success in business. Now you're becoming a successful speaker and coach and all these other crazy things. So my question for you is, and this is something that I ask every person on the show, because when you have an opportunity like this to interview successful people, you want to know the secrets, right? So my question for you is first, what's your definition of success? And then what are three things you do every single day to ensure that success for yourself? That is a great question. And I'm happy that you just asked that. (laughs) Um, It's it's a great question because the definition of success is unique to each one of us. Mm. So for me, there's a few things that define success for me. The biggest are I want freedom and I want fulfillment. Those two things are guiding principles in everything I do. Because if I have freedom and I have fulfillment, I also have joy. And so for me, those are huge, but I also, right, success used to be defined for me based on money. Used to be based on, you know, the external uh, key performance indicators that we all kind of look at. Money, things, different things like that. The more money I made, the more I realized, that is not success to me. Right. In fact, the more money I made, the more I'm like, shit, I actually don't want to make this money anymore. <laughs> it causes, right. The whole, the whole mo money, more problems thing is, is real sometimes. Yeah. Did he had it right, man? He totally did. <laughs> and so, you know, for me, it's about impact. And so if I have freedom and I have fulfillment and I'm focused every day on impact, impacting the lives of my kids, impacting the life of my wife, impacting anybody that I interact with, impacting the people I don't even know through the content that I create or the opportunities I have to be with people like you, that to me is success. The three things that I do every single day um, that really help me calibrate that, I've got a very regimented morning routine. And these are three of more than three things that I do every day. But these I think are three of the most critical because these are what I call my linchpins. So every single morning when I wake up, the very first thing I do is meditate. Mm. I quiet my mind. I clear it. I focus. I concentrate. I meditate. I visualize. And it's all a part of that process. 
And this is something that I did not do for a lot of years. In fact, my meditation practice is something that's come in in the last two to three. And I've realized that the more I can actually be, the more I can actually do. Love it. My issue is I've always had that doing self way overbalancing the being self. And so I start every day with that moment to get clear on what's important to me. I also break a sweat daily, right? So that's working out. Might be riding my road bike or my mountain bike. It might be lifting weights in my gym that I've built out at home. It might be uh, literally just stretching, but I break a sweat and I get my body moving. So once I've been still, I get everything moving, which gets my brain moving, which gets me focused, which gets me dialed in. And then the third thing I do, which I typically do alongside breaking sweat, is I read or consume some content. Um, I had the opportunity a few years back uh, to meet Aeneas Williams. And he said something to me, which I thought was an Aeneas Williams original, but I learned afterwards it wasn't. Uh, But he said, the only difference between who you are today and who you'll be five years from now is in the people that you meet and the books that you read. Now he's a pastor now. So he paused for effect and he said it two more times. So it hit me, right? Even the dense (laughs) self that I am after hearing it three times in a row from somebody who speaks as eloquently and powerfully as he does, you can't not hear it. And at that point in my life, I wasn't reading books at all. I was the guy that had a bookshelf full of books, but I'd crack it, couldn't get into it, couldn't consume it, consuming audiobooks. And the week after that, I got into a book called Attitude, The Remarkable Power of Optimism by Nito Kubin. And it's a book full of colloquialisms. And it's like concept application, quote, concept application. And I heard that quote a week later, which was not coincidence. No. And so since that time, I've consumed on average about a book a week. Um, because I truly believe that that's how we grow who we are is in the experiences and the knowledge that we funnel through ourselves. So those are three things, meditate, break a sweat and consume knowledge. Mm, Love it, man. So obviously this podcast is called the growth that movement. And I wrap up every single episode with this one question, but before we get there, uh, how do people get a hold of you? How do they get more from you? What's all that good stuff? Yep. So a lot of the concepts that we just talked about with embracing pain, avoiding suffering, getting clear, having a roadmap for really systematically creating your life of no limits and life of alignment. Uh, I've created a free resource for people because so many individuals were like, Brian, how do we get this? How do we start working on this? So if you go to nolimitsprelude.com, this will be a really good roadmap for helping you get clear on what's important and a systematic approach to start building your life of alignment. So it's nolimitsprelude.com. So anybody who knows exactly who they are is completely confused and has no idea where to start or somewhere in between, this will add value. And then brianbogert.com is my website. Um, I always spell the last name. It's B-O-G-E-R-T, not A-R-T, because that is going to be the place where a whole lot of the free content I content that I put out through Bogart's bullets with my YouTube channel, all my, all my social handles and a lot of the content is in there. So anything I can do to be of service and offer if, and how I can help to anybody who's listening, please say the word. Awesome, man. I appreciate it. Now, like I said, I wrap up every single interview with this one question that is in your life, what has been your biggest moment of growth? Whew. I'm going to pause for a second. Cause I've had a, I've had a number of them, but the <laughs> biggest moment of growth I would tell you that my biggest moment of growth was about two years ago when I started to understand the role that shame played in my life. It was something that was holding me back. And shame, as Brene Brown outlines as it is two, two talk tracks. One, you're not good enough. You're not worthy. I've had moments there. That's not been the, the narrative for my life. But the second is when you show up in the arena and you're ready to go big, you're ready to go to battle. It's who do you think you are? despite all the cool things I've done in my life, I've always felt the need to apologize for it. And so I've actually ratcheted myself back. I've bridled myself in certain ways to not live as big because I didn't want to have to apologize for other big things I was going to do. And so that was one of my biggest growth moments is understanding the role shame played in my life, the patterns that it created, the emotional triggers that came up and really being able to move that into a place of awareness so I could be intentional with it. And in those moments where I feel affected by it, I can choose a different path so that shame no longer holds me back. Mm, Love it, man. Brian, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom with my audience, but also just for being you, man, and and continuing to add value and create a massive impact in this world. I can't wait to see where you're going to be a year, five years, 10 years from now, because it's going to be massive. Uh, And I'm just glad that I can play a little part of it, man. Thank you so much. 
Oh, thank you, brother. Thanks for all the good you put in the world. And man, you're, you're on this ride with me, brother. We're going to be doing some cool stuff together. Thank I know you already. guys so much okay. for being a part of the Growth Now movement. This is how you can really help me out. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please share it out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that fun stuff. And let's grow this movement to epic heights. And it's all going to be because of you guys. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week.